and I have the honor of being the curator of the Benton Mackay Scott Parlor exhibit downstairs, which you're going to see in just a few minutes. So I was asked to prepare um, a little family album of Benton Mackay from childhood uh, to, his, to his death. And um, so I did a presentation, but I'm missing a connector, so we're not going to see it on the screen. But please check the museum schedule for programs next season, because we'll be showing this again, and you'll see it on the big screen. So good, Julie. We already have one program for next year. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> to look on the bright side. Yeah. Everything. All right. So if you go back to October 1921, that's what we're celebrating today. An article appeared in the Journal of the Institute of American Architects. And it was entitled, An Appalachian Trail, a Project in Regional Planning. And here we are today, October 2021, 100 years later. So we're celebrating today the article, the man, and his thinking. And that's what this is about. And Kurt has agreed to help me. We're just going to do some advancing here. Ben Mackay was born in 1879 in the little town of Stanford, Connecticut. And I'm going to move through this fairly quickly so that we can get to the actual ribbon cutting ceremony. But if you have any comments, any questions, we're a small group, just please speak up. He was the fifth of six children. He was born to Steele Mackay and Mary Ann Berry. Uh, I would say a theatrical family and a very literary family, if you had to describe them. Benton on the right and his sister Hazel on the left. And out of all the six children, they probably had the closest relationship. And you'll notice, and I'm sure Kurt, you might notice this when you look through the books that we received as part of the collection. There are some books in there that were written by Hazel. In 1887, he was eight years old at that time. And with his sister Hazel, that's when they enjoyed their very first visit to their Aunt Sadie's home in Shirley, Massachusetts. That's the place that became known as the cottage, and then later in his life, that's where he established Sky Parlor, on the second floor of a back room in addition to the house. But this shows, it was just a place for them to spend the summers, and he was able to do a lot of great explorations in the area. In the, in the area. When is that house still there? Yes, yes, uh, Brian has some pictures, and I think you can even go online and look at some pictures. Yeah, yeah, good question, yeah. I'm recording. Yeah, good question now. Uh, I love this picture, and he was always a beautiful explorer. It didn't matter whether he was 10 or whether he was 90. He was always a beautiful I love this picture, too. It shows that, that he, he did... Uh, he was a student. I can't say he was a very good student in his years in Harvard. After his first year at Harvard, he was actually on academic probation. So maybe he was doing too much exploring outside. I'm not sure. But finally, with some help from his older brothers, who were also going to Harvard, he was able to get an undergraduate degree in 1900, and then he got a graduate degree in forestry in 1905. Uh, one of the first um, graduate degrees in forestry uh, issued by Harvard. And that was in the same era as Gifford Pinchot. And so forestry was becoming really a new area of study. So these young foresters then were going out into the world to, to spread the word. And that included that new time. This is him all the way uh, on, on the left here. And you get to see what the typical hearted dorm room looks like. It's quite interesting. That group explains his grades. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think Keontae Line was popular. Um, I think I see a few books. But tennis rackets, it kind of gives you an idea of what they're up to. This is what he was up to a lot of the time. This is him in the center. And we actually, we think we have the actual uh, backpack that he's wearing. Because we have the same picture in reverse. And so the backpack is down there in the exhibit. Uh, but this is, it was on an exploration like this that he first began to realize from certain mountaintops that it would make sense to have a ridgetop um, trail that would bring people into the wilderness. 
I think this is a wonderful picture. You have to think about the times that he was born in and his family connection. Uh, the women are wearing the fancy, frilly white dresses and the big hats. It was very, um, I would use the word posh. It was a very posh time, and he was part of that. One of these is his Aunt Sadie. I'm not sure exactly which one. I'll have to research that a little bit. These are photographs of just some of the people that, uh, at, right after he graduated from Harvard, uh, some of the people that he was uh, associating with. I believe this couple was called the Johnsons. And if you do a little bit more research, you can find out. People, people next door. Yeah. They live next door. Okay. Is that Lucy? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Right on our couch. Oh. Okay. We're going to see him later on here. Mm -hmm. Ben married in 1915. Uh, he married, uh, her name was Jessie. Yeah, Jessie, Betty. Hardy Stubbs. Hardy Stubbs. I knew there was a lot of names to it. This is a picture of her uh, with one of Benton's uh, sisters. I think it's with Hazel. Uh, and this is a family picture, most likely taken at the cottage. This is Betty. And here's Benton at her side. They did die tragically in 1921. Uh, that's an important year because that's the year that his article was published. Um, she committed suicide. She was having some difficulties. She was a, uh, a, a sufferer, traveling all over the country, uh, marching and speaking to all different groups for women's rights to vote. And it really began to reflect on her mental stability. And uh, he, Benton had actually hired a nurse to take care of her. And when they were getting tickets in the train station, they were going to take her to a sanatorium for some rest. She bolted from the train station and jumped into the nearest river. And that was the end of her life. Many people believe that that's what spurred him to sort of step back from everyday living and begin to think about something else. And what he was thinking about was this ridge top trail that we now call the Appalachian Trail. And so by uh, October 1921, the article was published. I'm showing just some of the times that, that, that the family had up in Shirley Center uh, when he was older. Uh, winter was a long, long uh, season there, and they spent a lot of time with horse-drawn slaves. Uh, again, he was still spending time outdoors and contemplating uh, this rich top trail. Now I just have some photographs. Um, you can, I think this one is very indicative of the, of the thinking as, as he began to age. And this is where he's, he's looking at the hurried lives that people have in our metropolitan cities. Uh, and he's thinking, uh, we really do need uh, an opportunity to escape from the harried everyday life and spend time in the wilderness. So this really did influence a lot of his thinking. Uh, I'm not going to go into the whole history, but Ben Mackay did separate himself from the Appalachian Trail project at one point. And this is a photograph of him. He went on uh, to become a true believer in wilderness and helped to found the Wilderness Society. Brian, can you say a few words about this picture? Do you know this picture? Okay, it's, I do have a caption on the picture, but I didn't bother to write it down. Yes, this is. I know this is. These are some of the other founders. Bob yeah, Bob Marshall's in there. E each one of these people are identified. I just didn't bring the, uh, the captions with me. And this gentleman is identified too. But you get the idea, Benton is traveling in circles, we would say. And these are circles for people who believe in wilderness and the right to preserve it. I have some photographs now uh, as he began to age. Uh, and there was a time then that he was welcomed, felt, he felt wel welcomed back into the Appalachian Trail Conservancy's projects and he was welcomed back. And, became more recognized as the founding father. This again is up in Shirley Center, and this is his friend Lucy Johnson, who was with him when he passed away. He began to spend uh, 
more and more time, since they had been friends since his uh, college days, began to spend more and more time with her. She was a widow, uh, he was a widow, and they spent time together. I think it was a, a terrific mm -hmm. friendship. Just something in there. They, they were neighbors, but in the Kai house, they had no electricity, no running water. They only had pumps in the kitchen and no heat. So he basically lived with Lucy for at least the last decade. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the cottage stayed pretty primitive yeah. as far as mm -hmm. heat and electricity. And no heat would be a Running, cool running water, yeah. yeah. So it was. It was yeah. much more comfortable, and they, and they were great friends, uh, so it was a companionship, too. And there's also a caption for this picture, but I didn't bring it with me. Uh, Bette Mackay passed away on December 11, 1975, with her seat at his side. I have to give a shout-out to Larry Anderson, if you want to know everything that there is to know about Benton Mackay, I would recommend his book, <laughs> definitely. Yes. Yes, sure. and just to put a plug in for the current issue of our magazine, AP Journey, yeah. Larry has a great essay in there about the, what was going on in Clinton's life in 1921. A lot of things that Clinton talked about there. So. <coughs> it really gives you a good idea of what was on his mind while he was writing the article and leading up to it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, it's, it's drawn from Larry's bigger book. But, um. Okay. The photographs that I showed you are courtesy of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, uh, Shirley Historical Society, and then uh, the Dartmouth Library, the Rahner Special Collections Library. Dartmouth has been very helpful in helping us to put this exhibit together and previous exhibits that we did on. Um, Benton Mackay and Myron Avery uh, have been by our side uh, really researching. Because sometimes I show them a photograph you know, via email, a very primitive uh, copy, and they have to search through their <coughs> collections to find the original. And it takes them quite a bit of time. But every single case has been successful yeah, uh, with, with getting the original and getting it scanned and back to us. So they do have all the Mackay family papers. I think it's what, 200, well, 200 boxes? Of 385. 385? Yeah. Wow. It, it, well, I should say we're all partners in crime now. It's really thank, thanks to the museum because that gives us some credibility. It's a fairly historical society, which was very tiny when yeah. Clinton died. Um, Dartmouth, of course, museum. Uh, we end up on these big email chains with pictures coming in from mm -hmm. all other places and we share them and mm -hmm. try to remember where they came from and which is yeah. tough sometimes. But yeah. but our, our archives have some of the same pictures that show us where they came from. Yeah. It was very exciting when, when the, the photographs came in uh, from Shirley this yeah. time with this exhibit because I didn't know that many of those even existed. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they already had them scanned to uh, right. uh, very high resolution, we were able to pop them right into the exhibit. Mm -hmm. and I like that picture of him with five lights and where we were. Yes, we, yes. We decided to call it a map, but they said it's really five lights. Yeah. That's like the kind of first was a little messed up, and so they went in and came back to clean it up. Clean it up, yeah. Yeah, little gems uh, all the time were yeah. coming in, yeah. Any questions or comments? Uh, so is Shirley Center set up as a museum of some kind? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They, Shirley Historical Society is starting a bond. Not that it's known, so I don't know. Last time I was there, they were set up um, in a barn before you get into Shirley Center. Massachusetts is weird. You got Shirley Town, Shirley, and then you got Shirley Center. And it's like Shirley a Shirley Center. They're coming from the south. Yeah. Uh, we'll do it again. Drove through. I haven't yet. I, I plowed to stay at in Sky Parlor for yeah. a night. I haven't done that yet. I've been telling that story to everyone. Yes. Did yes. you find out, if I'm remembering correctly, did you tell me that the people that own the house now have that 
photographic Medbury. depth of Medbury. Yeah, yeah, they're going to give it to us. And you're, they're going to give it to us. Yeah. So would you want to go down and get and spend the night sleeping yeah, in the parlor? Yeah, I'll get it for you because, as you can see on the <laughs> Everybody's photos, a witness. Yeah. <laughs> what did he just say? <laughs> as you can see in the photo, of, uh, that includes the uh, bittern, the bird. Yeah. There's the portrait of his mm -hmm. uncle right there. Yeah. That's his uh, mother's uh, brother there, Medbury. Yeah. That's very prominent in Sky Parlor. Yeah. It was on the top of the dresser. Right. So I've already told our exhibit designers yeah, that, that someone here. who for some reason wants to sleep in the room <laughs> to communicate somehow no, with Matthew just, Mackay just uh, cool. is going to bring us that picture. And we're yeah. going to find a place for it in the uh, space downstairs. That's what makes uh, exhibit curating fun. Because mm -hmm. you remember these little tidbits. You know, and then you look forward to actually putting them in place. Yeah. And it really is collaborative. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're in trouble, Bill. Yeah. I he, remember he was that. He an interesting guy in his own right, too. Not as big as Beth Mackay eventually, but uh, died very young. He was in the uh, uh, New York uh, Roundtable group um, with some of the big literary figures of his time. Uh, his, his uncle was. So, uh, but he, he was connected, as you said, to family and uh, his work. Yeah, so Makai, rather simplistically, was the thinker and Avery was the doer. Okay. Mm -hmm. At what point, and I know they were collaborative at first and they kind of split, at what point did he sort of turn it all over to Avery as far as finishing up the trail. He didn't turn it over, it was taken. <laughs> okay, it was taken, is that what that Yes. We ended up on yeah. the thing that you know, setting up Dreamer and Doer is not really accurate because after he published the article, you know, Avery wasn't involved at all. He spent the next 10 years networking all up and down the East Coast, mm -hmm. okay. getting, getting people interested and um, mm -hmm. setting up the, First meeting in 1925, he was very active and he was up in, in Connecticut. And when he got Arthur Perkins involved, um, they go actually go out on the trail. People don't think of getting out on the trail, but it's the pictures around the exhibit of him out there on mm -hmm. one of his forays in Connecticut. So, um, yeah, Avery did come in in 1927. 27. And, um, Avery was very uh, determined. The difference between them is Avery wanted to trail on the ground at whatever cost. It meant cooperating with the government, so be it. Mackay was very adamant that it should be a trail of the wilderness. No road, no skyline drive, no anything. So, uh, so that built up all through the 30s. As different things as Avery cut deals to get the trail on the ground. Um, the guy uh, took a more pure vision. You know, to think of the guy in wilderness. In his article, Wilderness is mentioned one time, describing the Southern Appalachian. He didn't get into the wilderness thing until the 30s with um, Howard Leopold and uh, Harvey Brown and Bob Marshall and some of the others. So that's why they split and had a very nasty exchange of letters. Yeah. Shenandoah Parkway used to. That, that was, that that, was that the, was the final nail. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, it was Shenandoah, and when they put the Skyline Drive in, they were also talking about the Blue Ridge Parkway, mm -hmm. right. which actually would have done more damage. Um, there was talk of something like that in Vermont. Okay. Um, Georgia. So, Georgia. Yeah. 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 So there were Skyline Drive proposals everywhere. And mm -hmm. it was just out of the place. We probably hated Park. Park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a park conference, if you want to think about it. They need people in the park to get to the park. Right. So, you know, that was a conflict beyond the AT. So, and the people doing the work on the ground were the park people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, our first uh, chairman, William Wells, was park chair mm -hmm. and head of a big commission on national parks. Avery was a realist too. Yeah. President Hoover said there was going to be a shadow park, and apparently in those days it was going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he goes, "All right, 
let's save our powder for something that we, that we will win. And he was able to get the CCC to remediate a lot of damage and work up in Maine and a couple other places. Oh, yeah. And, and he didn't go to the CCC, he went to the South of Park. Well, I know, but they... That was his buddy. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing. He thought, okay, you're going to run over our trail, build up the new trail. Mm -hmm. And get that trail to go to Parkway, the South of Shenandoah, getting in Shenandoah, the CCC work in Maine, and, and other places. So, yeah, that's the kind of deal you're studying, but the idea that that um, the tribe is, is sitting back here thinking of his thoughts and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. He wrote a book called The New Exploration, mm -hmm. 27, 28, which he thought was a better explanation of the trail idea than the article. Mm -hmm. and the article had some other purposes. Well, and, and to say that Avery wasn't a thinker, he wasn't an intellectual lightweight, he did go to Harvard Law School. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good point. And there are a number of things that Avery wrote that mm -hmm. go on very eloquently about building Mm -hmm. Open space and everything else. I mean, you can take the entire audience and put them up against Avery and you wouldn't know which is which. So mm -hmm. they thought a lot as to how they got there. Mm 